Hello, Jan. Hey, Adam. How's it going? It's going great. Awesome. Excited to talk about CTF. Yeah, me too. So we're here on CTF Radio, and we're here today to talk about something that, yeah, what is CTF? Especially because we love using this acronym, and so we always get this question, what is CTF? So today, we're going to kind of break it down for people who are new to CTF, so we can actually talk about kind of what do we actually mean? So can you walk us through at a high level what what is CTF and what does it stand for, Jan? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start easy uh, with what, what it stands for. It stands for Capture the Flag. Easy. Um, and if you think about the game Capture the Flag as you played it in elementary school, um, you have two teams and you have... Uh, everyone has their their flags or there's a, a central team storage of flags and people run across grab a flag and madly try to dash to the other side uh, before someone tackles I have a confession to make I've never played an in person capture the flag No way the, the closest I ever had was on probably a whatever desktop machine we had some Windows XP machine there was a capture the flag game that I played <laughs> and that's the closest I came to a physical capture the flag that's hilarious. The, the Capture the Flag game, uh, I mean, I, I played an absurd amount of Unreal Tournament Capture the Flag. Yeah, that's, um, that's I think, that's, where that's most people of... get confused, right? Is exactly, because Capture yeah. the Flag is a super popular game mode for games, right? Is, yeah. We, you know, uh, yeah, Unreal, Quake. Did Quake have a Capture the Flag? I don't know, but... It was more of an Unreal guy. We'd have right. to ask Odo for Quake. Yeah, so a similar kind of idea there, right, in the physical world is you do the, the team's goal is rather than just blow each other apart, you have to blow each other apart and get to some place, steal a flag, and with that flag, bring it all the way back. I think Halo yeah. also has this, too. I recall yeah. playing this a lot yeah. in Halo. And so um, at some point... So what the when, heck does uh, that have to do with computer security, man? Exactly. Um, at some point when... You know, Unreal Tournament was in its kind of original peak popularity. Um, at DEF CON, this concept was evolved that you could play something very similar, but instead of uh, pixels and, and, and um, you know, rocket launchers, or in addition to pic pixels and rocket launchers, you could uh, have vulnerable computer programs and exploits. And uh, the, this new genre of hacker game arose um, back in, in like the, you know, early, early ages of, of, of the early to mid 90s um, or, you know, maybe the mid to late 90s. But, you know, this uh, CTF as a as a form of uh, formalized hacker combat mm -hmm. um, emerged where people would show up to DEF CON. Um, and uh, they would sit down initially as kind of an open free-for-all and just kind of hack um, systems that were set up by the competitors or by each other. Mm. In some of the early, early DEF CON uh, additions, uh, from what I hear, I, I didn't compete in them and I wasn't even at DEF CON as an as a attendee back then. So that would be something fun uh, maybe to dig into the history at some point and get yeah. some people on here to talk about that those times. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because the, the people, you know... <laughs> Luckily, they're still alive. It's a fairly new field. That is the so. good thing about, you know, computer security is those people exactly. are still around. It's not like physics where we're reading Galileo's work or something. Trying to <laughs> interpret it. It'd be nice to talk to him about that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah, a, a lot of these people, uh, you know, competitors would, would bring vulnerable systems to the, to the competition mm -hmm. or maybe systems they thought weren't invulnerable. Um, you have to be and, pretty and new to security to believe that a system is invulnerable. Exactly, exactly. I just actually finished recording uh, one of my lectures for my class where <laughs> I tried to get this across very thoroughly. Yeah, exactly. One flaw and it's over. Yeah. Um. So, anyways, uh, this was the early ages of CTF, right? Mm -hmm. It was this free for all, um, etc. As cybersecurity got harder, uh, more complicated. Um, and these challenges evolved to, to meet that complexity. Mm -hmm. um, you started seeing the emergence of these uh, hacking groups that would team up and, and 
compete in these uh, CT apps. And is that when it started uh, to become more game-like or, you know, do you have a notion there of how it transitioned from just like a show up and here's some system to hack versus like a, you know, more of a game style thing? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how that transition happened. Um, I think it was something that, that emerged uh, along with, for example, the concept of black badges mm -hmm. at DEF CON, right? right? So uh, a DEF CON black badge is a badge of honor for a, for a hacker. And so for, and... to catch people up, right? So if they're mm -hmm. super new to this, right? DEF CON is a annual, let's say, underground hacker conference. Uh, the way I like to explain it is it's so underground, you can't pay with a credit card. You can only pay cash to, uh, to attend. And it uh, usually occurs uh, in the summertime in Las Vegas where it's super hot and you pack a bunch of hackers into these conference rooms to talk about all things uh, cybersecurity related. And so... Not uh, just talk, go crazy. Talk and yeah, go... I mean, I, I was ignoring yeah. that. You know, I think people need to experience these things on their own. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. go crazy, party, hack, learn, uh, go to talks, uh, participate in contests, right? All that kind of stuff. I think the... Last numbers we had were something like 30,000 people attend this uh, conference in person every year, uh, which is super uh, crazy and super cool. So it provides kind of this uh, breeding ground for these types of competitions, right? And so the yeah, black badge, exactly. so then can you explain how why that is special? Yes. So uh, these competitions started arising at DEF CON. Uh, we just finished up, um, I mean, we, the community, just finished up DEF CON 28. Wow, uh, 28 years of DEF CON. This year. 28 years of DEF CON. Um, so this, this has been running for a long time. Somewhere around um, it, within the first decade of DEF CON, this concept emerged. Uh, everyone, when they pay with the cash to attend the conference, they get a badge. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, you it's a standard uh, conference thing. So you get your badge, you walk around, and, and uh, eventually the con got too big. Um, and... We, we and and now I mean I guess we're kind of indirectly involved, but like right. uh, DefCon the conference, they they needed uh, people that were like in charge and so forth. So there were became two types of badges. There were the uh, goon badges, which are the kind of organizing group of DefCon the conference, which are a good thing. And that's were, I think something that's happens a lot in hacker yes. culture is you take a yes. word that you know like a goon is normally a bad thing, but here these are volunteers who help uh, basically organize logistics. I mean they they'll if you hear Everything. uh yeah move aside or what are they when they're trying to like make a path uh for people yeah. <laughs> i mean it, yeah everything from that mm -hmm. to um when maybe this is uh jumping ahead a little bit when we had a ctf player collapse at the table from yes. dehydration yes uh the goons ran in and and uh you know <laughs> did the initial medical triaging exactly um yeah so uh, that just started getting kind of uh, specialized. Mm -hmm. um, everyone normally had human badges, and it would say human on it in some form. Uh, everyone else would have, um, you know, uh, or goons would have goon badges or contest uh, organizer badges uh, and so forth. Um, should in I case anyone's badge, I listening in the future, yeah, why don't you go get the badge? I'll, I was going to make the joke that in the future, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, at this point, you did not have to pass a, uh, a CAPTCHA to get a human badge. You know, we assumed that anyone who showed up and paid cash was a human. Uh, maybe that changes in the future. Who knows where we have, you know, uh, have to have robots that try to attend DEF CON. I mean, anything is possible. So as uh, if, you can, if you're watching the video, Jan is getting one of his badges. This is from uh, DEF CON 28. Um, and oh, the safe, God, safe mode badge. Uh, we had just talked about how at least I'm going to keep that badge pristine in its case. <laughs> Jan is mine is not, already covered in cat hair. Exactly <laughs> for you, so, for our our fans, our people. Exactly. This is uh, De the DefCon 28 uh, safe mode badge, and it's a um, uh, cassette tape for either those that are listening to yeah. us. Yeah. So it's got a side A, a legit... side B. It's a legit cassette tape. I, I don't even know if I have a Walkman or anything to plug that into. I don't even know if you do, Jan. But I have one stashed somewhere. I don't know if it's in my house. I, there's definitely. Hmm. Ah, my Jeep has a tape player. Wow, I think we finally found a use for your uh, <laughs> old Jeep, let's say, old exactly. reliable Jeep. 
<laughs> All reliable cube. Uh, Anyways, so this is the badge. Um, this one is almost kind of a bad example because it doesn't say human anywhere. Because right, because it's for DEFCON you know, safe, safe mode. Safe mode is a bit is, of a special. Exactly. It was uh, happening all online. Occasion. Exactly. So um, the uh, idea, though, they'd make 30,000 or whatever. Like my first DEFCON, DEFCON 9, there were 10,000 people, right? They made 10,000 badges or something close mm -hmm. to that. Usually you run out part way through because, you know, these are very custom things. It's it's not easy to make, you know, thousands of them and so forth. Right. Some year they have electronic components. Yep. Uh, some years they they uh, are like, they, one year it was a pressed vinyl. <laughs> That's um, so cool. Yeah, there's there's a lot of cool stuff with them. And um, anyways, as, as these badges started getting more and more specialized, um, the concept emerged, and maybe we should invite dark tangent onto this uh that would be podcast cool. to talk about this more thoroughly um and more authoritatively um but black badges arose as the ultimate in kind of hacker skill mm -hmm. uh and a very few amount of contests would grant the winner a black badge ctf emerged and these are not as... not contests like best mohawk or something like that which are fantastic contests and i think one year you almost right. got me to compete in that contest to <laughs> shave my head into a mohawk during the good? ctf i think that exactly. was the year we were playing in the contest hall arena at one of the tables that's right that's right and so that all those contests the lock picking contests, those kinds of things were going on they but, were all there. but those yeah. those are fantastic contests but here we're talking about black badges for the you know the the top of the top hackers let's yeah. say and it's it's very hard to um make a contest that you know is worthy of a black badge and and one of the kind of capstone um sort of contest of defcon was uh defcon ctf mm -hmm. and is defcon ctf um defcon ctf every year gets eight black badges wow um for the 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 winning team mm -hmm. right so originally um eight kind of emerged as a uh, solid number for where you have a team with a lot of hacking capacity, a lot of different specializations, right. um, but it's not too big to manage, right? right? Um, the old kind of, you know, uh, like the ghetto hackers and, and, and these sort of uh, elite hacking crews, they had their, their group of people that would dominate DEF CON, mm -hmm. they would get uh, black badges, and eventually they would take over organizing the CTF right. as well. Um, and so that's kind of the, the story of DEF CON capture the flag as mm -hmm. an event. Now, what does it look like um, on the inside? Well, it, it varies. Um, there are different flavors of, of CTF as a, uh, you know, game in, in, in gaming. There's also different flavors in C of CTF as a game. And is this something that's only locked to DEF CON now? Because it sounds, I mean, it no, seems like the no, idea yeah. kind of originated there and has it... Uh, morphed it, outward. It's exploded. Um, so shortly after DEF CON, um, there were a couple of CTFs, very, uh, I think the first, like, unofficial DEF CON CTF was something like, um, you know, 19, like, like nine, 1996, I think you already see, you know, something recognizable mm -hmm. as CTF. Um, uh, and then sh shortly afterwards, this concept really catches on mm -hmm. and you start seeing the uh international uh ctf the ictf from uh, uc santa barbara you start seeing um ctfs being run in russia with uh ru ctf you mm -hmm. start seeing a lot of um ctfs all around the world and now there's a ctf more or less every weekend they're not all in person obviously they're mostly online um defcon ctf now has grown enough that at some point it started needing a qualifying round to limit the attendees right <laughs> and so now the qualifying round is online and then the the top uh, hackers from the qualifying round are invited to compete in the finals uh, which so to give some usually. some context to what you're talking about so the ictf which is run by uh, uc santa barbara and giovanni vigna's group in the sec lab over there which uh full disclosure we did our phds there so we had our hand in uh administering and running multiple, some multiple ICTFs yeah. and also playing. Um, so the first ones were in uh, 2001 and 2002, which were local at UC Santa Barbara, where it was first uh, run as part of Giovanni's class. And then 2003 was when they had uh, 
teams around the U.S. that actually participated in this CTF. So yeah, it's crazy. And so you know, I think uh, good resources for people who are into this, like Jan said, CTFs every weekend, right? I mean, CTF time is a good place yeah. to go to go look at those. CTFtime.org. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so you're talking about uh, circling back. You're talking about different styles of CTF. So what does that mean? It yeah. sounds kind of like, well, yeah, you just hack things, right? So what do you need different styles for? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you might ask something similar in uh, in the computer game setting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it seems pretty simple. You run over, you shoot everyone on the way, you grab the the flag, you shoot everyone on the way back. Well, there are already different uh, minor variants in the computer mm -hmm. game world. Um, for example, there are variants where if you grab the flag and you get killed on the way back to your base, you drop the flag right. and your buddy can pick it up and, and try to finish the run. Or you can't um, shoot when you have the where, flag. So there are variants where you can't shoot. There are variants where you can shoot. There are variants where if you drop the flag, it goes back to the its home base. Right. There are you know, all sorts of really subtle changes and then bigger uh, modifications um, on that. Like, um, you know, the, the capture the base instead of capture the flag and so oh, forth. Uh -huh. So there's a... Uh, a lot of different variations in the hacking world of capture the flag as well. The basic capture the flag was the same sort of a tag defense. Everyone had a base and that base was software. Mm -hmm. And in that software was a flag, which was uh, a, a random a token of random bytes. Right. Right. And if you captured that, if you managed to break in, grab the flag and pull it all the way back, you know, exfiltrate it out of uh, the enemy, uh, network out of their software back to you you could submit it to the organizers they would see that random string they knew the original because they mm -hmm. put it there and they would give you points so um, then this, this kind of inherently implies that for this piece of custom software which you've been relating to a base right this means that by default the software should not read this flag right if it was a piece of software that just allowed you to read any file then getting a flag yeah. is not, you know, very impressive or important, which also gets to the core kind of security principle, right? Where, you know, a security vulnerability only exists if an attacker is able to do something and trick the software to do something it's not supposed to do, right? So if a system is supposed to be able to read any file, then reading a flag is not an impressive feat, right? We want to actually exactly. make the software do something it's not supposed to do. And, and, and uh, the interesting thing is there are now extremely educational capture the flags where the software will happily give you the flag. You just have to interact with it in, in the, the right way, not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, hack it, right? Um, but, but absolutely, especially at the DEF CON level. Um, and, and, you know, mistakes happen and sometimes the challenges are uh, the software is, is more trivially hackable than expected and so yeah. forth. But generally speaking, it should take an enormous um, show of hacking skill to be be able to to hack um, to to leak the flag. Right, which totally makes sense, right? I mean, that's you know yeah. where this is kind of the the goal of CTFs are to in some sense uh, test people's skills. But when you think about building this these types of software that have one yeah. intentional flaw that is something really cool, it's very clear to see. Well, you know, human beings when you're a company, let's say like Google or Facebook or whoever, you're trying to build software that has zero vulnerabilities. And yet oftentimes these companies fail and have security vulnerabilities. And so it makes sense that even, you know, some of the best people, when you're making a vulnerable service for a CTF, you're trying to just do one bug, but oftentimes that you don't meet that goal. Yeah. And maybe there's others. Yep. Yep. Or, you know, maybe you're, you're trying to just have four bugs. That makes it, you know, e even even trickier because right. then, you know, maybe they, the primitives that make up these bugs interact in some yeah, weird way. Two of them allow them to bugs. completely bypass your other two. So exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. So, anyways, um, so that's that's the traditional style, right? Uh, attack defense. You have an enemy base like you do in video games, and it's software, and you go in and you retrieve the flag. Okay, so then the video game um, analogy makes a lot of sense because you also have to play defense and try to prevent people from attacking exactly. your base, right? And and this this can take a lot of different forms, right? You can, um, and, and previous teams have tried uh, an almost completely network-based approach, mm -hmm. right? You uh, try to um, figure out signatures that you can apply okay. in network traffic to identify attacks and then draw connections, right? right? And that's the equivalent of, you know, the, the 
fighter being killed on the way back with the flag. Um, you can modify the base itself. You can try to patch the bugs in the software. Mm -hmm. This can be very challenging when you don't have the source code. Right. Um, and, and I guess uh, it is like a building, uh, right? You're like making changes to a building exactly. without the design. You don't know what's a load bearing wall necessarily. And <laughs> exactly. Depending on the design of the game, you could make changes to, let's say, the physics engine, right? So in the past, <laughs> teams have virtualized um, oh, right, the, right. the software in, in, a, in an emulator that has built in security features, right? So things like this. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different strategies. Uh, but again, this is kind of the base version. So mm -hmm. Um, as CTF has spread and become more um, adapted to uh, the internet mm -hmm. or to being run over the internet and so forth, um, this sort of uh, uh, team versus team direct competition is, is hard to scale. Right. Uh, there are CTF that try. Um, there have been uh, Rue CTFs and ICTFs that have scaled to you know a thousand teams or something, but but it's it gets extremely chaotic. Right. You have a one thousand versus one thousand free for all. Um, kind of a the, there there are you know memes that that we use for for <laughs> what can go wrong in these scenarios. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So um, other game styles have been created. Mm -hmm. um, one such uh, game style, very early one, and the one used for uh, DefCon qualifiers, for example, and and many many other um, online CTFs is uh, Jeopardy style. Okay. Um, competition. And what this means is like Jeopardy, you know, and originally it was actually the website was like the Jeopardy uh, challenge board or yep. the whatever board. And uh, you would have different categories and, and you had, you know, uh, potent ponables and, and uh, binary mastery and whatever, right? Reversing and, 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 and so on. Different categories of hacking, um, you know, prowess, mm -hmm. right? Web security and so forth. And you would choose uh, one team, whoever was uh, the top team or, or whoever solved the, the uh, latest problem or so forth first, would uh, choose a category and they say, okay, we'll take potent vulnerables for 200 points instead of dollars or points, yep. right? And it was the same as a Jeopardy. And then basically um, you would unlock this, this problem and it would be a piece of software hosted by the organizers mm -hmm. that you would be attacking. Um, you wouldn't be attacking teams directly. The team-to-team -team competition came from who can do this fastest, who can, right. um, you know, do uh, more problems mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and in, initially, uh, this came around as um, this concept of a qualifying event for DEF CON CTF, um, as far as I know, hmm. and then um, spread out and was adopted uh, kind of more globally. As a like, like you said, uh, with different variations, though, right? Different modes. Like exactly. maybe, maybe the the players don't get to choose which things to open mm -hmm. or not open, and so you know maybe the organizers choose, or maybe they're all open at yep. once, or you know. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Uh, it started from this Jeopardy style, and then mm -hmm. uh, you know it's still called a Jeopardy style CTF. It's by far the most popular CTF format. Um, okay, so you have kind of CTFs, right? And then mm -hmm. this large kind of capture the flag, um, trying to understand uh, and identify security vulnerabilities in software, which is kind of the goal. And then you have different game modes where you have attack defense uh, and this Jeopardy style. Yep, exactly. Awesome. Um, and then there are others emerged. Mm -hmm. So. Um, my first exposure to this one I'll, I'll talk about um, next. I, I think this was the original creators of it. Um, at a CTF that I, um, again, that also had a qualifying round mm -hmm. that was Jeopardy style. And then from that qualifying round, uh, we were invited to go to Japan in person and compete at SecCon right. CTF. Um, this was maybe 2015 or something. Um, SecCon CTF created as far as I know, they created this, uh, the King of the Hill mm -hmm. style of uh, Capture the Flag competition. And this is yet another variant where, um, and, and it's inspired, as far as I can tell, by King of the Hill in video games again, right? So you have, a, uh, you have to be the best to defend a particular room or something, right? But in the same sense, in, in the hacking uh, parlance, you have to um, come up with the best solution mm -hmm to defend your mastery of a challenge. Right. Um, and uh, there, there are 
can be any wide range of, of, of types of these challenges. The most approachable one to people with a computer science mm -hmm. background is, is kind of an algorithmic complexity improvement. Not necessarily, this wouldn't be a security challenge, right. King of the Hill, but it can be in, in cool ways. But if you, um, for example, uh, think of, of, of sorting. So you mm -hmm. have a challenge where you get just giant amount of data and you have to sort it as fast as possible. And you can think of, okay, uh, one team might invent bubble sort. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's n squared. And then another team might come up with merge sort, another team with quick sort, and then uh, these teams are kind of uh, improving on their solutions and so forth, and right. trying to to sort faster. In the same way, hacking uh, king of the hill challenges have some sort of uh, measurement of mm -hmm. of how uh, good your solution is. Sometimes the solution is just your solution against the organizer. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, challenge, and sometimes. It is actually competing with other solutions in kind of a code wars type scenario. So like driving where each other up and up. And uh, exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we actually, in my undergrad, we had a professor who, for one of our first kind of programming classes, for one of the assignments said, okay, I'll give extra credit to the person who writes this Java program using the least amount of semicolons. And so ah, that's yeah, awesome. it's like it's kind of an arbitrary goal, but it really does help you try to focus and try to really understand the language to say, okay, when are semicolons actually necessary and you can do you can abuse the heck out of like a wall statement a while statement and lots of yeah. other stuff is what i remember that that is very cool yeah that that's a great idea um but but yeah so so basically there are these kind of three and, and then there have been these are the three mm -hmm. big ones um definitely attack defense and jeopardy or jeopardy is the most popular attack defense is the second most popular right. king of the hill is is way behind but still uh popular um there have been other ones um also out of japan there was a bullseye mm -hmm. um concept where your uh solution had to be the most reliable mm. which um, actually has a lot of parallels in real world applications of security right absolutely like you, yeah you know if you're um you know, a well, government or whatever and you're going to launch an exploit you know you don't want to launch the exploit you'd rather have like a 99 percent chance that it's going to succeed rather than a 10 percent chance exactly yeah. Um, and uh, there have been styles, uh, there have been minor variants on all of these different mm -hmm. styles. I mean, um, me and you at, at, in Santa Barbara organized an attack defense ETF where there was no um, uh, defense possible, if I remember correctly. Correct. You had to yes. identify attacks. Yeah, so the idea was to defense. turn it into a network analysis game to where you would get a PCAP that had all of the network traffic in it. And then you'd have a website that listed all that network traffic and said, okay, which of these are malicious attacks that actually were exploiting you? Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a crazy There, there were some issues. The, 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 the idea was interesting. Yeah, there have been, um, ICTF is great. hybrids of these. Yep. Um, there was one hybrid uh, in Santa Barbara in 2011. There was a hybrid of attack, defense, and jeopardy, mm -hmm. where there were two types of, of points, basically, that you could score, one from exploiting other teams and one from solving challenges provided right, by the organizers. Right. Um, our DEF CON CTF, this might be jumping ahead, has been uh, a hybrid of attack defense and king of the hill. Right. Um, and then we just did, so, uh, yeah. at, for, for two, uh, DEF CON 28 quals, we introduced uh, golf style challenges, which tried That's to bring right. king of the hill into a Jeopardy style, uh, which kind of was inspired by code golf, right? Which is a similar thing we talked about, is how can you do the same thing in the least amount of code or like uh, vim golf is another thing right of how do you do a, and i don't know i use emacs but i understand the concept right how do you do it with the least number of keystrokes to accomplish some goal yeah yeah, yeah exactly cool so th there's this uh widely uh diversified type of ctf so i guess from from the perspective what is ctf yeah the summary is you take a competitive concept Mm -hmm. like King of the Hill or Capture the Flag and so forth. And then you build in a security aspect. Mm -hmm. You put in um, vulnerable software or, uh, you know, unsolved uh, or, or maybe just, you know, academically solved but not very demonstrated cryptographic flaws right. and all of these things. And then you see what the players can do. Cool. That's, so that's actually a great introduction. And maybe we can end this with talking briefly about what do you think, like, what do you get out of CTF? Like, why do teams play CTFs? Yeah, um, the, the biggest thing for me personally, mm -hmm. I, I can speak to this. Oh, don't um, speak for the whole community. I don't think they'd appreciate that, but. Exactly. <laughs> um, 
at a very personal level, what I get out of CTF is um, this incredible uh, journey where at the beginning of the journey, a CTF typically, let's say, lasts a weekend, mm -hmm. right? So Friday night, you sit down and you... I think that's actually um, a good point we didn't mention. So it can be anywhere from mm -hmm. eight hours to 48 hours to some go for weeks and weeks. Um, there typically are, uh, most... there's a, yeah, go ahead. There's a style of CTF called, well, of CTF called War Games, right? Which are just right. offline and, and are always, you know, available. You right. just rack up points uh, over time. So anyways, um, yeah, so that's the time aspect, but you were talking about, so you working on a challenge yeah. for the weekend. So I'll give, I'll give a concrete example. Yes, please. Right? Um, SecCon, I mentioned the, the finals where we were king of the hill, the qualifying Are they sponsoring round. sponsoring this episode? <laughs> Enjoy the smooth <laughs> taste of SecCon CTF. Mm, always goes down smooth. Anyways, um, the uh, qualifying round for that SecCon was, was insane. I, I sat down Friday night. Mm-hmm open up uh, the, the, the CTF and, and, you know, grab a challenge to work on. I open up the challenge. I'm not making this up. It is a photo of a pancake <laughs> that is half eaten. And on this pancake, someone had printed. I don't know how you print on a pancake. I didn't ask, uh, but but they managed. I guess they must if have. If you design this challenge, that. let us know and we'll have you on the show and we'll talk about it. Exactly. Yeah, I'd love to talk to the person that designed this pancake. On this pancake is a QR code, and the QR code is partially eaten. Uh -huh. A third of the someone ate a third of the QR code. I think I've and, heard and, that's the best part. It's like crunchy in parts, but exactly, like not exactly. You know, yeah. And 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 the the challenge was, of course, recover mm -hmm. the data in that QR code, and it's half eaten. Um, that that challenge was incredible because I started out, I had never even thought about what is inside a QR code. I mean, you've probably seen you it, know, it before, just... right? Like, you know what a QR code yeah. looks like, but you didn't yeah. really dig into like, you know, how it works or anything, right? Yeah, it was a, a two dimensional barcode. Somehow it encodes data. <laughs> you photograph it and your phone tells you that, you know, this is some URL and you go. Right. So uh, the by the end of that CTF, through several different QR challenges, mm -hmm. I could read QR codes manually. Like I could see QR codes. It was insane, right? I had libraries I'd written to mm -hmm. parse QR codes, to parse like the very, you know, inner workings of them that, that more generalized uh, previously available libraries couldn't uh, handle. I understood how the error correction and QR codes worked, how the encoding worked, how uh, pixel overlays, the timing. It was amazing. And I would have never bothered to learn about QR codes, most likely, in my right. normal life. Right. right? But, but this CTF sent me down a, into this journey of discovery in which I went from knowing nothing about a technology such as QR codes mm -hmm. to knowing so much that I was able to uh, understand it in some ways better than people that, that use QR codes on a regular basis, like really use them, right. not just scan them, but make them and so forth. Right. Um, and that is the feeling of an amazing um, CTF, uh, where you, you have your mind kind of expanded forcefully and painfully uh, so that to drive, understand. That drive for competition and that drive for winning, it really kind of matches, exactly. I guess, the hacker drive for knowledge, right? Because you're uh, diving into this new area and whether you do it or not, I think I'll, I'll talk about a, a similar one, which I don't think I did directly, but oh, I mean, there, there are some always some fun ones of like, I do a lot of web security kind of CTF challenges. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's a crazy, oh yeah, that was a fun one of, I think it was even an unintended vector where there was a HitCon quals that we were competing with shellfish in Santa Barbara. And it was this insane thing where uh, I remember the challenge correctly because there were two different, um, they first, yeah, they were storing in my SQL, like the connections that you were making. And then they would check to like blacklist you somehow, if you use certain keywords based on that, that my SQL database, and then they would talk to this Postgres database and then do some stuff in node after the fact with that. Then the intended solution was that you're supposed to on the, my SQL database, you were supposed to, um, uh, 
create a packet size that was so large that it would get dropped by MySQL and the node application would never get the response back. Anyways, well, I didn't realize that. So I spent a lot of time, I read the, and I'm, I'm a traditional, I got into basically programming as a LAMP developer, right? Like uh, PHP, MySQL, developing web apps. I mean, that was my bread and butter love LAMP, back in man. the day. Exactly. So like, I, on Rails? I don't mess with Postgres. Like I, you know, when I have the thing, like I know there's pros and cons, whatever. I just know MySQL and that's just what I do. Right. So I never really mess with Postgres. And so what do I end up doing? Reading the Postgres manual, trying to figure out how to evade their stupid filter. And I found there's some insane feature of Postgres that you can specify what character is like the slash encoding character. So instead of something like slash n you can change the slash to like a tilde or something insane and you could do that and you bypass their filters and checks and we ended up writing an exploit and popped that service and it was just like yeah an insane thing you you realize like oh i'm i'm reading docs about or other web challenges i'm reading docs about a mustache uh, templating engine <laughs> like i'm really understanding what cap what i can do with the capabilities and the functions that i have in order to do what i want so yeah i think those there was are another another uh challenge, I think same CTF where I look over at one point and you are looking at MySQL or no, not MySQL, PHP, oh, PHP source, source code. Yes, yes. That's something yeah, I learned yeah, from like, Orange. Uh, it's like his challenges is what I learned from those is you got to look at the source code or Perl, I think in one case or yeah, there's been crazy yeah, yeah, cases. But where, and I don't mean like something written, like, I mean, no, like you're, you're, you're understanding how PHP. Perl works yeah. internally in an implementation level to do some, I think, what did you do? You abuse some functionality there, there's a weird open. pearl has this insane feature where you can open a file and you can if it starts with a bar you can put different like uh programs to execute so it'll actually execute something instead of opening something because pearl is a monster so i i don't know but yeah yeah and 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 it was you know a ctf that required you to yeah. understand the implications of an unguarded open call exactly um yep. yeah so so it's th this is what is kind of CTF in a nutshell. It is forced learning. It's something that I try to convey in my course mm -hmm. as well. Um, in my course, uh, I try to cover an enormous amount of cybersecurity concepts. And, uh, you know, I, I have to be honest with the students, like there's no way to lecture all of this knowledge. This knowledge has to be obtained, right. you know, not given in some sense. Um, and, and so, you know, what they learn and what their feedback is afterwards is we learn to learn yep. where every yep. week is like that's a CTF. Great. Yeah, right? that's, so that's, yeah. I, that's probably the biggest thing about CTFs, right? It does force you to learn yeah. things very quickly. And at a, I mean, the thing I like to say is like, sure, I can, I can lecture to you and explain to you about a buffer overflow. It's not, it's actually not that complicated, right? I mean, I have slides 20 minutes. I can walk you through it. You'll understand what happens in a buffer overflow. But until you sit there and exploit this specific program that you didn't write, that was written by somebody else, and you have to debug it because your exploit doesn't work on the first try, uh, that really deepens your level of understanding far beyond. So like once you put fingers to keyboard, that's really where that learning, I think, happens a lot for these CTF challenges. And that's why CTFs are so important is because they force that, right? It's like, no, no, don't write me a paper on how buffer overflows work exploit this binary <laughs> cool so exactly. i think on that note we've got a good uh, basis here for to kind of catch people up on what ctf is and hopefully in the future we'll be able to explore these different areas that we talked about absolutely cool i'm excited about seeing this uh podcast evolve yep see you everyone bye see you Adam. bye everybody <laughs>